Amen. Yeah. Judges chapter 6. Do we have anybody to do the uh, Hallelujah. scripture? Thank you. <laughs> Judges chapter 6. We'll wait for Miss Missing Jack. Today we're actually shuffling our our different functions in the body of Christ. Can you imagine? Well, anyway, if you had, if you were missing a hand or an arm, it makes it more difficult to navigate, right? And sometimes, whenever you have body parts missing, it makes it a little bit more difficult. But we thank the Lord for multitaskers. Amen. Yes. Amen. And people that have multiple <coughs> gifts. Hallelujah. If you have your Bible with you, you know we do always have a basket of Bibles in the bag, but she won't be long. Ah. Anthony's got, a, got my sword, man. Anthony's good to see you in the house of the Lord, brother. Yes. Praise God. Anthony used to be my traveling partner back in the gap when I was begging for a place to preach before I had a church. <laughs> he run the roads with me to all them churches, man. Good to see you, brother. And he always had his sword with him. I remember that. Yes. So here we go. We're going to Judges chapter 6, and we're going we're gonna to read... Verses 1 through 10. I'm just kind of waiting. There we go. We got it up there. Y'all ready? Let's read the word of the Lord together. It says, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east. Even they came up against them. You know, I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm going to stop real quick because you see right there it says the Midianites and then the Amalekites and then the children of the east. Isn't it true that sometimes whenever things start going the wrong way, it seems like it's just one thing after the other after the other. And it's like, Lord, how much more are you, is, are, are you, how much more can I take? Because your word says that you'll never give me more than I'm able to handle, but it sure seems like it's just piling up and it's just getting worse. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I know that I've questioned that before. Well, I just want you to know in this text right here, that's what I see. I see it's piling up and it's, and, it, and it's getting worse. It says they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till you come unto Gaza. And they left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. That's an old King James way of saying donkey. For they came up with their cattle and their tents and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. I want you to, let's read that verse one more time. Verse 6. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Verse 7. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you. And I drave, or I drove them out from before you, and I gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the God of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. One of the verses that stuck out to me, and this is what I titled my message this morning, Pain Makes You Cry. I want to say that one more time. Pain Makes You Cry. Let's pray real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you this morning, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your house to seek your face, to worship you, and to hear your word, oh Lord God. Lord, this situation in Israel's life brought them to a place where they cried out unto you. 
The pain that they were experiencing caused them to cry out to you, Lord. And when you heard the cry of your people, you showed up to bring deliverance to them. I pray this morning, Lord, that whatever someone in this place or watching by video may be going through and they're experiencing pain of whatever the sort may be, that they would find themselves coming to the place that they would cry out to you. Even for myself, Lord, that if I find myself in a place like that, that I would cry out to you, oh Lord God. And we're asking you to show Show up, O oh Lord, and to bring deliverance in the midst of our lives. Amen. Pain makes you cry. Amen. Pain can come in all shapes, sizes. Pain can show up. Sometimes it's spiritual pain. Sometimes it's physical pain. But pain can sometimes bring you to your knees and it can make you cry. You know, I know that growing up in my house, my dad, you know, being an ex-Marine and all tough like he was, you know, there wasn't really a whole lot of crying that was allowed. But, you know, one of the things that I have found is, is that sometimes we have certain mindsets in our hearts, right? Through, through traditions, maybe even what I received from my dad and what you have received from your people before you. And they meant, well, they love us. But one of the things that I learned whenever I faced the greatest pain of my life whenever my sister took her life in a tragic fashion was that I just, I just let it go that night. I just remember thinking, Oh my gosh. And I just let it go that night. And I can remember really being curled up in the bed, kind of like, in, like a baby crying like a baby. All right. But you know, one of the things that I learned through that season in my life, and I learned how to cry in the presence of the Lord. Now you can do what you want with that. There's a whole lot different when, listen, there's, I have found that there's great power when I'm crying in the presence of the yeah. Lord. I have found that I have, I have tapped into a power source that when I'm going through something and I empty myself in the presence of the Lord to give him an opportunity to say, Lord, I need you to show up. I'm crying out to you. I'm in the midst of pain and I can't fix this situation. I need you to do something. Because a lot of times what can happen is, is that when we find ourselves in circumstances, we either sometimes try to pick it up ourselves and fix it ourselves. Or if we have heard the word of the Lord, we will turn and we will try to, we will attempt to surrender and to cry out to God and say, Lord, please take this. I can't carry the burden anymore. I'm just wanting to share with you real quick. Since that was the title of my message, I didn't even have that in my notes, that I learned a great power. And humbling myself in the presence of the Lord and crying in his presence. In this passage that we read, Israel is going through some similar days that I think that we're facing now today. The Christian world that we're facing today. See, the time frame of the judges was right after the exodus whenever God brought the children of Israel into the land of promise. And it was before the king. So the first king that God gave to Israel was Saul, even though his plan really was to give them David. We don't really have time to go there this morning. I just mentioned it in passing. God has a perfect will for our lives, but sometimes we get ahead of it. So in this time frame of the judges, which was about 400 years, the word of God keeps saying on more than one occasion that during the time frame of the judges, there was no king in the land and that the people did what was right in their own eyes. Now, the similarity that I'm making to the word of the, to the world that we live in today is that in, in this country, America, that was founded on Judeo-Christian values. I can remember growing up in public school in the little school in Lafayette, L.J. Alamal over there, that we had the Pledge of Allegiance on the wall. We had the Ten Commandments on the wall. God was invited into the, into the schoolhouse. Well, now we've kicked him out. We don't, we, we, we stay away from the pledge because it says in God we trust or whatever, whatever, however, I can't even, I don't even remember the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which we stand. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Amen. And so well, it, it's a, it was a nation that was, that was to be founded <laughs> under God. Amen. And, and what we've done is we've asked him to exit stage left. And because of that, the morality that we are experiencing in our country, I don't know if you've noticed it or not, but it's a lot different today than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? And what we're being told by society is that certain types of behavior, you just, you know, it's kind of like the YOLO thing. You only live once. You be you and I'll be me and you don't judge me and I won't judge you. And, you know, just like a, many things, everything goes. 
And that's what the time frame was right here. And one of the things that happened is, is that as Israel went into this foreign land, God had asked them, listen, I'm bringing you into the land. And it's got a land that's full of milk and honey. In other words, I got a lot of produce for you. I got a lot of fruit that I want to give to your life. But whenever I bring you over there, don't do what they do. Don't, don't worship their gods. You know, one of God's promises that he had spoke of in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 8, he said, this is what I'm going to give you. He said it, it was called the law, but you know, the law was God's word to Israel. He said, I'm going to give you my word and I want you to hold this word with you wherever you go. I want you, he actually told him, he said, I want you to write it on the walls of your house. I want you to put it on the doorposts of your house. I want you to put it on your forehead. I want you to put it as a wristlet. And he said, I want you to speak it to your children when they rise in the morning. I want you to speak it to them when they go at, to bed at night. I want you to speak it in the noonday. I want you to bring it when you're going. I want you to bring it when you come. The Lord wants his word in the hearts and the lives of his people. Amen. Because, see, his word tells us what really his character is. But in the society that we've lived within or that we're in now today, they, they're trying to convince us that this isn't even the word of the Lord. That, no, this is just simply the word of man. And, and they continue because what they're doing is, is that they're trying to justify the decisions that they're making for their life. They're trying to convince us that any kind of lifestyle is okay and any kind of way that you want to go is okay. But it's contrary to the word of God. And when you bring that up, then the Bible doesn't really hold any weight today like it used to back in the day. I can remember... You know, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie before. Sometimes I get an image in my mind when I write something in my notes. And I'm like, oh, man, that reminds me of that movie. There was a movie that I saw on TV one time called The Book of Eli. <laughs> and, and, and in The Book of Eli, Denzel Washington was blind. And he had a sword. And, and it was like he had these superhuman kind of like instincts to where even though he was blind with this sword, and he could just like thrash crowds of people with this sword. And he was on a mission. And come to find out in the end, the mission that he was on was that there was one last holy Bible. A Bible like this one is, what, that is the way it was worded on there. A holy Bible. There was one last Bible in existence. It was during the time frame of Armageddon and the world was falling apart. And his whole mission was to grab a hold of this book because evil men wanted to grab the book. And they wanted to destroy the book. And he's going around and he's thrashing people. And when it's all said and done, he gets the book and he has it in his possession. And then do you know what he does with the book? I don't know if you noticed it at the very end, but that's the part I'll never forget. He sticks it on a shelf. If I remember right, it was a dusty old shelf. And he sticks it in the middle of like three or four other shelves. <coughs> right next to the Quran. Right next to oh, wow. the Book of Buddha, whatever that may be. Right next to all these other holy books. So the world convinces us today. There's many holy books and there's many holy gods and there's many ways to go. See, even the country that we live in has become what you can call a pluralistic society. Pluralistic meaning plurality meaning many. There's many gods and there's many holy books and you can't say that your way is the right way. How can you do that? You're, 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 being a, you're segregating and you're pushing people away. No, the word of the Lord teaches us if we read through it enough. And as we continue to study on Wednesday nights, we're going to realize that the world is full of gods with a little G. But there's only one big God with a capital G. His name was Yahweh. Hallelujah. He's the one that called Abraham out from amongst the heathen nation. And he created a nation called Israel when he broke Jacob's hip. He changed his name. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob, it, the, the deceiver, but it will be Israel, prince of God, one who rules with God. And God has been through that nation. He gave us Jesus. And now in Christ, hallelujah, we become born again. And he changes our name. He changes us from deceiver to one who will rule with God. I got good news for you this morning. Life may not always go the way you want it to, but you have, an act, you have access to the Holy One of Israel. You have access to the Ancient of Days, and His Word is alive, amen. And it's not the Word of a man. Yes, God used man to pin. God used man as a tool. And I keep saying this because I run into people all the time. And, oh, that's not the Word of God. No, no, no. God used man as a tool, as a vessel. The Apostle Paul told young Timothy, the pastor, he said, all Scripture is 
is inspired. Theo, God, Neustos, breathed. God breathed. All scripture is God breathed. God breathed it in man, brought it through man onto the paper so that man could have it in his hand to read it. And again, I say, how do you want God to communicate? Listen, when I go out on the streets or I used to for the Shripper Petroleum Festival, they didn't have it or when I would go into the jail or wherever I would go, like trying to do other kinds of evangelistic. I love talking to people that don't love, know Jesus. Because I want to give them, I want to give them a seed, amen. And, I, and listen, I'm, I, I always start off very calmly. Like, what do you think about Jesus, sir? Well, what, what do you think about the Bible? I think the Bible was written by men, and it's it's just a word. It's just, it's not the word of God. It's the word of men. And you know, one of the things that I realized is is that man wants God to prove Himself to him. <laughs> and, and, and I don't understand what man expects from God. Whenever we all communicate in human language, what, how do they want God to communicate with them other than through human language? And that's what God has done. He's graciously given us his word, amen, and he's preserved it upon the earth. So this is the time frame of Israel where they are. Everything is good to go. You just do what it is that you want to do. And, you know, something else that happens in the midst of this time frame is that Generation after generation, as they move into this land and they begin to do the very thing that God asked them not to do, they begin to intermingle with the world around them. And as they intermingle with the world around them, they slowly start taking some of the traditions of the world with them, right? And then a week passes by, a year, maybe a decade, actually a generation, whether it's 40, 60, 80 years, whatever definition you want to use of a generation, and one generation after another generation. And the next thing you know, you start running out of people that knew who God really was back in the day. And now there's a big old mixture that's going on. And I got to tell you that in the modern church today, there's a lot of mixture that's going on. And what do you mean by that? Well, what I'm trying to say is, is that I can sit here and start listing off a bunch of names. But that's not really what I'm intending to do this morning. But there's prominent women evangelists or teachers that churches buy her material. And they use her material to do Bible studies that has introduced the concept of contemplative prayer in the church. Well, what is contemplative prayer? It's more like Eastern meditation. Okay, where you empty the mind in order to allow other spirits to come in. There's other practices that they call soaking, where just, you just want to soak into the presence of the Lord. You just want to soak into the presence of the Lord. Just empty yourself. And, and listen, there's nothing wrong with being saturated with the Holy Spirit. But when you start turning the worship, worship of God into some kind of a mystical thing that's going on and we start adding things from the eastern parts of religion that are contrary to the word of God and we start allowing it to come into the church, the next thing you know, we think that we're serving God, but the reality of it is, is that his name has changed, but we don't even realize. The children of Israel at this time are actually worshiping Baal, but they think they're still worshiping Yahweh. And that's what's going on in the time frame of the judges. And the word of God said in the beginning when we read it, it said that the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. What were they doing? They weren't worshiping God the way they were supposed to. God, if I could say Jesus, what did not have their entire heart. There, there were elements of their heart that were being spread out to false religion. And there was false doctrine, false teachings that were going on in the midst of all of that. And it was bringing Israel away from God. And God wasn't okay with it. You know, I've also seen one other thing I was going to say. I had it in my notes. Various forms of dancing. Have, has anybody ever seen like uh, whenever people dance in the church? I'm not talking about like we used to do back in old day Pentecostal religion. You know, whenever somebody gets the Holy Ghost and they just take off and do the Jericho march for the Lord. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sometimes you see these uh, women that begin to do various types of dance and various types of worship. Now, I got to tell you that I've seen this take place in Mexico. And I'm telling you right now, it's got a different spirit on it over there than what I've seen take place sometimes in the Church of America. And one of the things that I, listen, sometimes some of that stuff that's coming in is a different spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. 
right. It's, it's a different spirit. And it actually comes out of like Greek mythology, the nymphs, which were some type of a demonic spirit. Listen, and there's teachings out there that are interconnected to all of that. And all of this stuff is coming into the church. Yeah. And it's distracting. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Listen, whenever somebody is worshiping the Lord, one of the ways that you can know that it's true worship of the Lord and it's not worship of something else, God is getting the glory. Yeah. Not the person. Whenever the Apostle Paul and Silas in the book of Acts were walking through the street and it said a woman with a spirit of divination, which said, which is in the Greek is a, is a spirit of python, comes up and what is she saying? These men be of the Lord. They speak for the, whole, for the most holy one. Everything she was saying was true. But she was working from a different spirit. Paul rebuked her and caused, and caused her to become silent. Because she was taking attention off of the Holy One of Israel and she was putting it on her. Any type of worship in the church that takes the focal point off of Jesus and puts it on self or puts it on something else is not of the Lord. And I'm here to tell you in this story right here where we are, they worship in Baal. And there's a problem. And God has a problem with it. So some of the things that we've already read that I wanted to point out. If you go back to verse 1, it says... The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. I like certain things that I see. I kind of try to read between the lines. What happened on the seventh day? God completed his work and he rested. Amen. So listen, on the seventh day, God completed his work and rested. And he started something in the Bible that runs all the way through. It's called the Sabbath. The word Sabbath describes the seventh. It describes a time of fulfillment. It describes a time of rest. Now, people have completely changed doctrines, and they said, if you don't go to church on Saturday, and if you don't baptize this way, you're not even in the will of the Lord. They've done turned it into something that the Word of God says it was never intended to be. What the Sabbath was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He has come to give you and I a Sabbath rest to our spirit man. Amen. They, if they, what, what are you talking about? Jesus said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for your, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your weary souls. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's rest. And I can even give it to you even further proof. I don't have it in my text. We don't have time to go there. Because they got seven. But if you go back and you read Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 4, it will teach you and it will tell you that if Joshua, if you got a King James, it says Jesus, but it was the wrong translation. If Joshua would have given them rest, talking about in the Old Testament, rest from their wanderings. If Joshua would have given them rest, the psalmist wouldn't have said that there was a future rest to come. Because Psalms came after Joshua. So what did the psalmist say? There's a future rest to come. He was talking about Jesus. <laughs> but with that, that's what we're looking for, church. Whenever we find ourselves in the midst of turmoil and chaos, the rest that we're looking for, that our heart is longing for, is Jesus. Amen? The Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. See, sometimes God will allow things to take place in your life to bring us to a place of fulfillment, to bring this thing to a final end that's causing problems in our life and moving us away from the Lord. So don't be surprised if the Lord puts you in the midst of a situation and you don't know when you're going to get out. God's going to get you out when, when he knows that the work is complete. Amen. Verse two, it says the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. It never fails. When we open the door to sin, for some period of time, it becomes more powerful or stronger than we are. And it will begin to dominate us until we come to the place where we cry out to the Lord. The hand of Midian prevailed. I said it last night when I was speaking to the young people. And the, and the reality of it is this. Is that sin will always take, a further, take us further than we want to go. And it will keep us longer than we want to stay. Amen. That's right. Amen. The hand of Midian prevails. Sometimes our enemy seems to be more powerful in our life than what we expected. I got good news for you, though. He doesn't have the last say so. Amen. The, the enemy of your soul doesn't have the last say so. God Amen. has the last say so. And he knows when to bring the deliverance. Amen. In verse two, it says, because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made themselves dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. See, when the enemy gains power in our lives, we start to experience a spirit of fear. 
What's going to happen to me now? How am I going to deal with this one? What am I going to do? Let me hide from all this pressure. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before, but I know that, listen, the spirit of fear is a real thing. Amen. And it's the opposite of faith. That's right. Yes. The enemy of your soul will try to strike you with a spirit of fear to drive you into hiding, to prevent you from being able to trust the Lord. Look at verses four, 3 and 4. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and they, they destroyed the increase of the earth. And listen, I want you to know this. The enemy will steal from you and he will try to leave you hungry. The word of God says in the gospel of John that Satan comes, but for no other purpose other than to steal, to kill and to destroy but I have come that they might have life and that they can have it more abundantly. That's good news this morning, Amen. church. Amen. Amen. The enemy wants to steal from you, but God wants to give you abundant life. So I want to encourage you with that this morning. That even though, listen, can you imagine another, another nation? Listen, I, I've, never, I've never seen a field. I've been to some outdoor concerts when I was younger. I've never gone back to the place where I was before. The next day or three days later to see what the grounds look like. But I can remember watching some old videos of Woodstock. Oh, I mean, dude, that, that crowd tore that place up, right? I mean, it was just a mud pit. Can you imagine all of these people? What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you a vision. When the Midianites came and the Amalekites came and the children from the east came, the Bible says that they came like a multitude of grasshoppers. And essentially they ate up all the sustenance of what the children of Israel had. There wasn't even any grass left for their, for their donkeys. There was no grass left for their cattle to eat. The enemy comes in and he wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to rob from God's people. That's what the enemy wants to do. But I, again, I got good news. He doesn't get the last say so. Amen? Amen. Verses 7 and 10. God's word and plan never changes. He would say the same thing time and again. He says this to Israel. I delivered you out of Egypt. Has God delivered you out of the world this morning? Yes. Amen. Listen to me. When we talk about na these, these other nations out there that are not Israel, we're talking about the people that are not the children of the Lord. I don't say that ugly. I don't say that mean. I'm just saying you're either a child of God or you're not. That's right. And how do you become a child of God? You get born again. You somebody, somebody, we were praying this morning, and when we prayed, me, me and Brendan were in there, Miss Matilda, when we were praying, the Lord just put it on my heart to start my prayer with thanking the person in my life that first planted the first seed of the gospel in my heart. It just so for me happened to be my older sister Debbie. And, and, you know, I don't know who that person is for you, but you're sitting in a church right now because somebody, it might have been a Sunday school teacher. It might have been your, your mama. It might have been your mama's friend's sister. I don't know who it was, but somebody had the word of the Lord on the inside of them and God used them as a vessel and out of them a seed of the gospel was planted in your heart. And you need to be thankful. That it fell on good soil, amen, and it took root, and it's producing fruit in the midst of your life. Hallelujah. God wants to produce fruit in the midst of our lives, amen. amen. God's word will never change. His mind never changes. He said, I delivered you out of Egypt. He brought you out of the world. Amen. He delivered you out of the land of the Amalekites. He delivered you out of the land of the Amorite. He delivered you out of the world system and he brought you into his marvelous light. He translated you, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. He translated you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. If you are indeed born again this morning. And how do you know you're born again? Because that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you how you know you're born again. Not because you were in vacation Bible school when you were eight years old. Maybe. Maybe that's when it happened, church. It, it certainly could. An eight-year-old can definitely get saved. Thank God for vacation Bible school. Amen. 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 Uh, it, 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 it maybe, maybe it happened. I don't know when it happened. Maybe it happened one day you were sitting in the back of the church and the preacher, like somebody like me, said, you don't even have to come up to this altar. You can raise your hand right there or you can open up your heart right there where you're sitting and you can invite Jesus in. It might have happened right there. Maybe. But you know how you'll know if you're saved? When you open up your heart to Jesus for real, 
I'm talking about for real, man. The preacher don't need to know that. You don't, it's not, it may not be your business that you're sitting next to them, but right there, wherever they were, whether they were on their knees in their room, in their car, driving down the road, tears running down their eyes, wherever they were at that moment in time, and they opened up their heart to God and they meant business with God, God knew. God knew when they meant business, and let me tell you something, something supernatural happened whenever they meant business with God. And you want to know what happened? According to the word of the Lord, according to Ephesians chapter 1, what happened is, is that the Holy Spirit moved into their heart. Let me tell you something, child of God. When the Holy Ghost moves into your heart, your life will never be the same. I'm not trying to say you're going to wake up tomorrow morning and you're going to be all on fire for the Lord, standing on the chair of the pews and preaching the gospel. I'm not saying you're going to be standing outside in the street carrying the cross and telling everybody about Jesus. But what I am saying is you will be different when you wake up. When you get up from that spot, you will be different from that point moving forward than what you were before that point right there. Christianity is not just something that happens immediately. Christianity is also a process. When you plug yourself into the house of God, into the will of God, the spirit of God through the word of God begins to move on your heart and in your life. And he begins to change you and mold you. He's the potter. You and I are the clay. And, and like the, the prophet said, God told the prophet, will the clay speak back to the potter? That's not how it works. God is the one that molds. And we can be rebellious. I remember I wrote a poem one time for Sierra. I don't remember exactly how it was. But it was like the whole world was like that little clay. That little potter's wheel. And he's sitting there and he's turning it. And that wheel's a turning. And here's that clay in the hand of the potter. But then all of a sudden that clay goes askew. And the next thing you know it's getting all crumpled up. And it's getting all crippled up. And it's falling. See that's what the Lord said to Jeremiah the prophet. He said, he said, go to the potter's house and you're going to see the clay. It's all marred. Tell Israel, my people, that that is them. But I can do a work in them. See, the fall of man caused you and I to become marred in the eyes of God. Because that's what sin does. It mars us. It perverts us. It moves us in a direction opposite of the way that God wants us to go. But listen to me. He's the potter. You're the clay. He can mold you. He can create you to be what it was that he always intended you to be. He can do the same for me. Amen. I want to encourage you, though. Listen, it doesn't happen overnight, Christian. It doesn't take much. I'm one of my favorite preachers, Lauren Larson, used to always say this. You don't really need to know much to get saved. You really don't. You just need a preacher that'll tell you the truth. Preacher that'll tell you the truth. And what he's going to start with is this. That man was created in the image and likeness of God and everything was good. And then here came the serpent. The serpent is the deceiver. The dragon is a destroyer. He's the same one. He came in and he put his lie and his poison into the human race. And now you and I, born of Adam the first time, are born of sin. And we have a sinful nature. And now we're clay that's gone askew. We're marred in the eyes of God. But good news, good news, because the potter never gives up. And he's going to start all over again. He see, yeah, how many times do you get frustrated with people? I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I'm just going to be real with you. I'm like, but you know, at least I recognize it now. I'm like, Lord, please, I don't want to walk around like that all frustrated, right? Because I can't change people. I can't make people do what I want them to do. I wouldn't even want to do that. You want to control somebody else's life? Manipulate them to make them do what you want? I don't know. That might be, I don't want to do that. I want people to want to do the right thing for the Lord. Amen? Whenever I got that frustrate, that frustration feeling in my heart, though, you know, I know that the Lord wants to mold me. He wants to mold me and he wants to build me up. He, his desire is through his word and through the spirit to make me look more like Jesus. That's a long way to go, folks. I like that song. <laughs> I know I can't sing good at all, but I like that song. How's it go? Uh, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a day to make the moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars, but he's still working on me. Why? That's a little child song, but there's a lot of theology in that, my friend. What are you trying to say? Because the God that I serve with one word on one day made the planetary bodies. That's what I believe. Listen, the science is going to have to prove himself to me. He's going to, the Bible doesn't answer the science. Science got to answer to the Bible. Why? Because I believe God one day and the Holy Ghost came to live in my heart and I got a testimony that God is real, that he is alive, he's not dead in some tomb somewhere. I have seen him transform my life.
life turned me into some high school dropout drug head that couldn't do nothing for himself and give me some hope on the inside of my heart. Oh, no, you did good for yourself, preacher. No, this preacher ain't did nothing for himself, my friend. God did a creative miracle on the inside of my heart. Rose me up and said, get up, boy. I got something for you to do. I got a word to put in your mouth, and I want you to speak. Amen. Hallelujah. God. Yeah, the God that I serve created the planetary bodies and told them exactly what motion to go in and causing all of this stuff. That, 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 I don't, that boggles my brain. But he's still working on me. Because <laughs> he gave me a free will. This ain't even in my notes. This is just what the Lord wants you to hear. He gave me a free will, just like he gave Israel a free will. And many times with our own free will, we tend to go in our own direction. We go in our own direction, and then we cause our life to become askew. But the Lord is not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on me. He's patient and he's kind. And I think that's how I got on this rabbit trail. I was thinking to myself that God's not really like that. Even though I still get frustrated with people when they don't do what I want them to do. God, I'm not saying he never gets frustrated. But he's long suffering. It means he suffers long. It means he's patience with folk. <laughs> Amen. And he has mercy and he has grace. And he's, he wants, he's just waiting for you and he's waiting for me to come back to him. He's saying, I'm just, I never left. I'm sitting here with, uh, with arms wide open, waiting for you to come back so I can hold you, so that I can build you up, so that I can strengthen you, so I can rebuke this spirit of fear that's over your life and allow you to walk where you're supposed to walk. Listen, but at the end there, verse 10, we said God's word, I said God's plan doesn't change. He said the same thing again and again. I delivered you out of Egypt. I gave you victory over the Amorite. But look at that last word, but you have not obeyed my voice. See, that's where we got to something. We got to start somewhere. Amen? Two things that I noticed in the text, and then we're about to get into point number one, is that the word Midian literally means strife. Now, can you imagine that? Just imagine this big old picture. All right, here we are. It's, 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 it's time to start the agricultural cycle. So what do we do? We sow seed, right? We sow seed in the ground. That's how you, I mean, I'm not a farmer, but that's what I read. You, in order to start the agricultural cycle, you take seed and you put it in the ground. There's a complete harvest motif throughout the scriptures. The word of God is like a seed, amen, and the rain of the Holy Spirit comes and it nourishes the seed. We're not going to get into that right now, but I'm just trying to make a point. You put seed in the ground and you expect a harvest. But like clockwork, every harvest cycle when they planted their seed, when it was time for the harvest, because you know, I would imagine farmers nurture their crop. Miss Matilda gives me some Tomatoes every year. Thank you, Miss Matilda. Tomatoes and okra and all this other kind of stuff. She brings it every year. And you know what? I would imagine they got weeds that try to overtake some of them plants you plant. I would imagine they got thorns and thistles because of the fall of man, according to Genesis chapter 3, that try to choke out the fruit of the land that you have there. So I can see Israel over there. They planted the seed. They're tending to their crops. They're nourishing their little, um, probably not a sapling. That'd be more like a tree. But they're nourishing that little germinated seed that's poking up out of the ground. And they're caring for it. And here they come. Every year like clockwork when it's harvest time. Here come the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the children from the east like grasshoppers. And they just come in and they just steal everything. They ravage the land. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be... Frustrating. That would put me in a place where I would be like, oh, Lord. So listen, I want you to know that the word Midian means strife. Now, I don't really know. I know I use this a lot, and hopefully this is in your life. But I think that we can see at least little elements of it in our, each and every one of our lives. I always go back to the Jerry Springer show. I don't even know if that's still on television or not. If it is, I'm sure Jerry's getting old. The only reason I'm saying that is, is because I can remember watching that when I was, you know, a teenager. I'm like, dang, man, look at that girl just went off on that girl. Look, look, yeah, I'm all into it. And then one day after the Lord started getting a hold of me, he said, that was your life, son. You were living the Jerry Springer show. There was drama every time you turned around. Some kind of dramatic problem arising somebody says the wrong thing somebody does the wrong thing and the next thing you know you're blowing up and you're frustrated and you're arguing and you're screaming and you does that make sense Midian means strife that's can you get that picture a household full of strife that's not the Lord's will the Lord doesn't want to allow Midian to come in and bring strife in the midst of your life God wants to heal us 
God wants to make us look more like Jesus. He wants us to be able to have peace and calm on the inside of our hearts. I'm not trying to say that this whole world is going to bow down to you and I. No, this world's full of chaos. But if we're walking close to the shepherd, amen? I was listening to a preacher the other day. He said, the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know what he said? He said that the shadow doesn't have anything really in it that can harm you. It's just a shadow. But what it does do is it tells you that there's something nearby that's casting that shadow that could cause pain and hurt to you. So as long as you're, when you're in the valley, if you stay close to the shepherd, you'll be safe. Amen. So I just want to encourage you with that this morning, that when you're in that valley and you don't know when you're coming out, just stay close to the shepherd. So Midian means strife and he, they would impoverish, which means to empty out, to dry up, to make somebody low. And that's what the enemy wants to do to people. He wants to make them low. In their life. See, for the people of God, though, the answer is always the same. Judges 6.24. You can put that up there if you can. Judges 6.24. We're talking about Gideon. See, this whole story is about Gideon. Because Gideon is the judge that God raises up in the middle of this story. And in the middle of this story, God shows up and he sends an angel to speak to Gideon because he's looking for somebody that's going to stand up in the midst of all this impoverishment, in the midst of all of this lack, in the midst of all of this destruction, somebody that will stand up and take a stand for him. And what is the first, one of the first things Gideon does is this, he builds an altar to the Lord and look what he calls it, Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom. In the King James, it's all one word, and this one here, they put a dash right there. Jehovah Shalom. What does that mean? The Lord, my peace. The word Shalom means peace. Now listen, when we, in the church, a lot of times, I didn't know any of this stuff, so that's why I try to tell y'all stuff. I know my, my sermon, my sermons are long. I ain't got a lot to say. <laughs> Just bear with me. You only hear on Sunday morning and a little bit on Wednesday night. I'm going to try to take it easy on you on Wednesday night. We, we, we consider this little place right here the altar. Right? And sometimes we come up here and we kneel down. It's a, this is a good place to get comfortable with. But, but you know what, this, what an altar really is? It's not like a ledge of wood with, covered with carpet. The altar in the Old Testament, what was the altar? Where the sacrifice was brought. Right? The altar was the place the sacrifice was killed and was placed on the altar as a burnt offering to the Lord. And what that was signifying was that God was reminding himself, my plan is at this point in human history, but one day my plan is going to come to a place of fulfillment when I'm going to send my son, the sinless one, the lamb without blemish, and I'm going to allow him to be placed on this altar right here to offer his life as a sacrifice. And now for you and I as Christians, what the altar is supposed to represent is a place of death to self. See, Matt's pride, Matt's flesh, Matt's self wants to get in the way of God and wants to prevent God from having his way. And so when I do come to the altar, if and when you do come to the altar in the church, I'm never a coercion. I don't like to coer try to coerce people, but sometimes that's a good place to be. Even if you got an altar in your house, sometimes, what does that mean? Just fall on your knees and tell Jesus how much you love him. And when you do that, what should be happening is, is you should be emptying yourself of self so that, so that the Lord can fill you up with him. This should be a place where self dies, a place, when I'm not physically, spiritually, a place where self dies and lets go of self so that God can have his way. That process I was talking to you about earlier, where he's molding us and making us look more like the Lord. So the first thing Gideon did was he built an altar. He called it Jehovah Shalom. I need some peace in my life. I got some Midianites in my life that are causing strife. And well, the way you're going to get peace is you're going to come back to the altar. Because you see, as we move forward in the story, I'm going to tell you what's happening. And I already told you, they were worshiping Baal and they were calling him Yahweh. They, they had a mixture in their religion. They thought that they were serving the Lord, but the false doctrine had confused them. And they weren't even worshiping the, the right Lord at all. And things weren't going right in their life, and they don't understand why. So one, that brings me to my first point. You ready? This is first point. We have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere. I'm going to give you two scriptures in a second. One is Judges 6.11. You can go ahead and go to that one. 
And then after that, we're going to go to Judges 6.28. The first thing I want to say under bullet point number one, under we have to start somewhere, is this. Get out of the wine press. And then number two, tear down the altar of faith. All right? Look at Judges 6.11. It says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was, when, which was in Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abazrite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press. Why did he do that? To hide it from the Midianites. Now, one thing I got to tell you is if you look a little deeper in the language, what's really going on is, is that he's actually trying to thresh wheat in the wine press. Now, I'm not a farmer and I'm also not a harvester, at least not a physical harvest. My understanding of wheat is that it comes in a grain that grows at the end of the stalk and that it has a husk around it. And that the way that they would remove the husk from it is that they would crush it. And then the way that they would get the crushed husk out from amongst the grain is that they would, they would beat it out on the threshing floor. But then they'd get almost like a big old, kind of like a pitchfork kind of thing. And they would take it and they would throw it up in the air so that usually they'd have like a flat spot with, that would have a rocky area where they could crush it first. And they would throw it up in the air. Why? So the wind would carry the chaff away. See, there's, there's a harvest motif in the New Testament that says that he's going to put his wheat in the storehouse and the chaff he's going to burn up. Yeah. I mean, whether it's the flesh of your life, God doesn't want chaff in your life, but also chaff's not making it to the kingdom of heaven. Only the wheat's going to make it. But my point is, is that why in the world is he in a wine press threshing wheat? <laughs> you ain't getting no wind in there. A wine press has walls. It contains the grace. He's in there because he's hiding, because he's in the midst of fear. One of the first things that you and I are going to have to do if we want God to be able to work in our life is we're going to have to step up and start moving forward. We're going to have to move away from fear. We're going to have to quit threshing wheat in the wine press. We're going to have to get up and we're going to have to start walking for the Lord. That's number one. God can't work in the spirit of fear. God will not work in the spirit of fear. He'll deliver us from the spirit of fear. Amen. He'll give us victory over the spirit of fear. Then now he can use somebody. Amen. But we'll never, we'll cower in fear if we're dominated by fear. Right. God doesn't want us to be dominated by fear. Amen. He wants to set us free from that. So that's number one. Get out of the line, friends, Gideon. You're not going to, you you're not getting that done. Now, I didn't put this in my notes, but I remember preaching on Gideon before. <laughs> one of the reasons when God speaks to him, and God, you know what God calls him? He says, you mighty man of God. Dude, don't you like it when the Lord speaks? You know when the Lord's speaking to you? you? You know how you know the difference between when the Lord's speaking to you and the devil's speaking to you? The devil's like, He's, you're worthless. You're, you're worthless. You're no good. Look at you. You're pitiful. You can't get anything done. That's a lie. Let me tell you right now, that's a lie. That's not how God sees you. If you're saved this morning, if you got the Spirit of God on the inside of you, and listen, he, 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 even if you're not saved this morning, He still sees you on the way that you can be. The Lord speaks to Gideon, and He says, you mighty man of valor, I'm about to use you to get something done for my kingdom. And you know what Gideon says? Me? He says, he says I'm the smallest in my house of the tribe of Manasseh. He, he, basically, what, what he really said, he said, basically, he said this, I come, and I went back and I did the research. Manasseh had the smallest amount of numbers. I went back to the book of Numbers a long time ago, and what I remember from that, they had the smallest amount of numbers other than the tribe of Levi. They had the smallest amount, so they were the smallest tribe, and he said, we, I come from the weakest clan. So that'd be kind of like your kindred, your kinfolk. Come from this tribe. We're the smallest tribe, we're the smallest clan, and he said, and I'm the youngest or the smallest in my daddy's house. And you're going to use me? <laughs> you calling me a mighty man of valor? You better believe it. You better believe God is calling you a mighty man of valor. You know why God wants to choose a Gideon? Because God wants to get the glory this morning. Amen? God's not looking for the best looking. He's not looking for the strongest. He's not looking for who he who can has the greatest of skill. God wants to take somebody from out the wine press that looks like they couldn't have gotten it done without the Lord. And then he wants to build him up. He wants to strengthen him. Hallelujah. And he wants to do something in that person's life. And he wants to work through this. So that's the first thing. You got to get out the wine press, my friend. Number two, tear down the altar of Baal. Look at Judges 6, 28. 
When the men of the city arose in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down and the grove was cut down. That was by it. Most preachers won't tell you this, and, but this is how weird and perverted their religion was. What the children of Israel were doing, you know what a grove is? It's an Asherah pole. An Asherah pole, Asherah was a the female cult deity connected to Baal. And what this was, and listen, I'm not trying to get weird on you, but I'm about to tell you, it represents a male phallus. And listen, we see this in, throughout society, all in the, in the occult world. Look at the back of your dollar bill. I'm just telling you to do this stuff. That, that's, why, that's why I try to, to lead people in a direction so that they can see physical evidence. As a matter of fact, that's your homework. You go home and you Google obelisks, pyramids, ziggurats that are around the world. And you start counting where they got all these things. Washington Monument, in the Vatican, all over Europe. I'm talking about those obelisks, pyramids. In Egypt, in Canaan, in South America. One guy's flying over China said, I saw one over there. Ancient and then also modern things that represent this very thing that when Baal woke up, whenever the Lord told Gideon, you got work to do, the first thing that he did was, hey, listen, he went at nighttime and he did. He cut down that thing and he, and he used that in the altar of Baal for fire. And then he, he built an altar for the, he made an altar for the Lord to offer a sacrifice to God. And whenever the men of the morning woke up, I imagine it in my mind, they look out and they scratching their head early in the morning, they standing on their porch and they see the smoke already rising in the sky. And they're like, what's going on over there? They go grab Gideon's daddy and they're like, look what your boy did. He tore down the altar of Baal and he's burning it. Listen, God wants to destroy false religion that's in his house. That's right. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God's people, the Apostle Paul, John, Peter, Jesus himself, came against and combated false doctrine. Why? Jesus said to his disciples, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. What is leaven? It's yeast. What does yeast do? A pinch spread throughout the whole batch of dough. What was he talking about? The leaven of the Pharisees was the false doctrine of the religious leaders. False doctrine entering in causes confusion to the people of God. God says right here to Gideon, the first place you got to start is you got to expose that which is false. They think they're worshiping me. They're not even worshiping me. So he does. He gets up and he and he begins to destroy. See, when we want refreshing in our life, that's the first thing we got to do. We got to start with repentance. Amen. The word repentance means to change the mind and to change direction. There's a scripture out of the book of Acts, Acts 3.19. Acts 3.19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Sometimes we feel dry. We feel dehydrated spiritually. We, want, we need a refreshing from the <laughs> Holy Ghost. What the Lord would tell, want, want me to tell you this morning and what the Lord would speak to the preacher is that if you've turned in the wrong direction, you need to repent. You need to change your mind and you need to go in the right direction. Then my restoration comes. Then my refreshing comes. Then I come to bring hydration to your dehydrated spirit. Amen. Repent. Reconsider. Convert. Turn again to the right way. Whether the people knew it or liked it or whether they wanted to hear it, God's people weren't serving God anymore. And in order for something to change, there needed to be repentance. And he started by getting out the wine press where he was hiding in fear from the enemy. And he got out, he built an altar for the Lord, and then he tore down the altar of Baal. He made it clear to the people that they were going in the right direction and that they needed to turn. If we want refreshing from the Holy Ghost in our lives, then we will need to turn from our ways and mindsets and turn towards God's ways and his mindsets. He says, my thoughts are above your thoughts. My ways are above your ways. Amen. I hope you're still with me because we got two more points to go. Y'all hang in there. I'm going to speed it up. Number two, I want you to know something. If you choose to, this is for this point number two, you ready? Expect an attack. Point number two, expect an attack. Listen, when you give your heart to the Lord, and you make a, a conscious decision that I am going to serve the Lord. And you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to you. got a mark on your back now, my friend. You're a target for the enemy. Now, you should not live in fear for that. Because he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And the worst thing that the world can do is destroy your body. 
I, oh, that's not very encouraging, preacher. Oh, Lord, i got to find me another church. No, that's what Jesus said. Don't fear him who destroys your physical body. Fear him who can destroy your physical body and your eternal soul. That's right. Many of people gave their life for the Lord. I'm just trying to say that God, you got a target on your back, but he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. The spirit of God is greater than the spirit of Antichrist. And even though the enemy comes against you, God, if God ain't done with you, my friend, and when he's done with you, guess what? He'll bring you home to glory. Now, are you convinced of that this morning? Yeah, that's right. Are you convinced of the fact that to take your last breath here is to take your first breath there? And that place over there is a whole lot better than this place right here. That's right. No, if you believe that, then you know what? It ought to start changing our life. <coughs> I'm talking to the preacher. If we believe that, it ought to start changing our life. If the cares of the world. Again, I wish I could sing. There's a song, though, that says, look full how does it go? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of life will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Listen, look full into the eyes of Jesus. Look full into the face of your Lord. And when you look to him, then the things of this life are going to grow strangely dim. But preacher, ain't nothing going my way. The, 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 this isn't right. That isn't right. The job that you've been, I've been faithful to, even that ain't right. Nothing's going right. Guess what? Look to the beautiful face of Jesus. Hallelujah. Because he's right. And he's always right. And he'll never do you wrong. Amen. Amen. And when you breathe your last breath here, you're going to take your first breath there. Yeah. And you're going to walk on the streets and go, my friend. That's what the word of the Lord says. I'm all in. I don't have plan B. Uh, the 401k ain't going to save me out of this. Je Jesus is going to save me. I'm convinced he's real. I'm convinced that there's eternity to face. Amen. Judges 7, 6. Expect an attack, Christian. It says, in the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth. We're 300 men, but all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. Now, what I want you to see here is that the Lord is, the Lord is whittling them down. He's whittling the numbers down. See, God wants to use Gideon to bring an attack on the enemy. But they start off with 20,000. We'll get to that in a second. And then he whittles them down to 10,000. He said, you still got too many. I want you to bring them down to the water. And I'm going to tell you the ones that I want to fight with. And, and the ones that he chose were the ones, I'm guessing. I can't tell you for sure. He just says they laugh like a dog. So this is what I imagine. That they were sitting over here. I don't think that they had their face buried in the water. Okay, I think that what's going on here is that they're, is that they're drinking water like this. And that they're looking. See, they're aware, even though they're drinking water because they're thirsty, they're aware of what's going on around them. The Lord wants you and I aware. He wants us to be aware that there may very well be an attack by the enemy. The enemy, has, he's looking and he wants to bring an attack because he wants to try to drive us away from the presence of the Lord. If you belong to God and you start doing something for God, you should expect an attack to come your way. God wants us to be aware that we are in a spiritual battle. He told Gideon to choose the men that lapped the water like a dog. While they drank, they remained aware. That's what I believe happened there. I can't see it. I don't have a picture, but that's what I believe. Look at 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober. Is he talking about don't drink alcohol? Well, that could be true too. Because what happens when you drink out too much alcohol? You can't see right. You don't hear right. You don't even know which direction you're going. Come on, somebody. Help me out. That's why the word of the Lord says, don't be drunk with wine, which is excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. See, when you drink too much wine, it diffuses into your bloodstream and it starts to change the way you think. It changes what you think, it changes what you hear, it changes what you see, it changes the way you act. I mean, if you're a Christian and you go out and you throw too many back today, what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. A lot of your old man's going to start resurrecting. What did you used to do as an old man? Somebody help me out here. I, am I either telling the truth or I'm telling a lie? Or maybe you ain't bad like I was. Okay, that's good. Well, let's use the preacher as an example. When the preacher throws too many back, he starts thinking differently. He starts seeing things differently. He starts hearing things differently. He starts acting a whole lot differently. Maybe it was just me. So if that doesn't work for you, that's fine. But, but from what I remember, when I put myself in that place of darkness, 
yep. amongst all them other people in darkness and started hanging out with all that, I started acting like them. Yeah, that's right. I started worshiping Baal in a lack of better ways. Okay, so that's just a little line for you because it wasn't in the notes. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, keep your eyes open. Be aware of what's going on in your surroundings. Spiritually speaking, don't be drunk in the spirit. That's why I don't understand some of these movements that have taken place in the modern church. Everybody's like stumbling around <laughs> and laughing and, 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 and oh man, we're drunk in the Holy Ghost. And they on the ground barking and acting like animals. And the word of the Lord says, be sober. I never did understand that after the Lord started opening my eyes. Why are we calling this a move of God? And everybody's acting drunk. The Lord said, be sober. Keep, be aware your enemy is like a, a lion and he's, your adversary wants to destroy you. So be prepared for an attack, my friend. But guess what? The Lord can use people that are aware. Amen? My last point this morning is be prepared for an attack, but expect the victory. Amen? Be prepared for an attack, but expect the victory. Look at Judges 7, 2. The Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. <laughs> the Lord said, we got to whittle these boys down a little bit. Why would you do that, God, right here? Lest Israel vaunt itself. That word vaunt there means to lift yourself up. See, if I let you go into battle with these 20,000 men and I give you victory over the Midianites, Israel's going to think they did it. Israel's going to come out of this battle thinking, man, look at this, boy. We had 20,000 people and we put it on. No, 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 no. That's not going to work. See, they're going to vaunt themselves against me saying, my own hands have saved me. That's one of the things I love about my personal testimony. And, you know, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. When I, when I look back at where, and I don't even know that every single thing that I did was exactly God's will, but I know one thing, this is, I'm here to give him a little bit of glory. When I think back to when I was 17 and 18 years old, and I was like a high school dropout, sitting on some air conditioner outside of a convenience store, waiting for some dude to roll up and get me high with his, own, with his marijuana that wasn't even mine. And I, and I imagined the steps that God took me through. To bring me to the place where I ended up with a master's degree in nursing and a master's degree in theology. And to think how God has changed my life. And then along the way, when I start to tell somebody about where I used to be, and they're like, look what you did for yourself. Yeah. Look, how, look what you did for yourself. And you see, that's the way my daddy was. Boy, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Get up, boy. Um, and I, you know what I always say? No, 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 no. You're confused. I mean, I appreciate what you're trying to say. But that's not the truth. The truth is, is that God did this. Yeah, because right. if it would have been left to Matt Avery, he'd still be sitting on that air conditioner outside the triple quick in Southside Lafayette is where he'd be right now. But no, God said, I got a different plan for your life. Hallelujah. And he said, get up out the wine press. Hallelujah. And trust me. Build an altar unto me. Jehovah Shalom. I want to put some peace in your life. I want to take back what the enemy is impoverishing you and taking all your sustenance. And I want to put back on the inside of your heart. Amen. Now look what it says in, in verse 7, chapter 7, verse 3. See, God wants to get the glory. That's why you need to expect the victory in your life. Now, therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead, and then return to the people 20 and 2,000, and there remain 10,000. I'm sorry, they started off with 32,000. Start off with 32,000, whittled them down to 10, then whittles them down to 300. See, you can expect a victory. You know why? Because God wants to give himself glory. Some people are like, well, why do you serve a God that sends people to hell and he's an egomaniac? The God you serve is an egomaniac. All he wants is glory for himself. That's because he's a good God. And he created everything. And he wants to glorify himself so that people on earth will see how powerful and good he is. So that they also will want to believe in him. So that they also can be born again from the dead. So that they can also inherit eternal life. That's the good God that we serve. No, the one that's an egomaniac is the liar. Amen. That's the right. word of God says that on the day that you were created, you were 
perfect in all your ways until pride entered your heart. Till you saw how beautiful you were. And what did you say? The lion fallen angel. You said, I will exalt myself above the throne of God. I will, God will exalt myself above the host of heaven. That's what he said. He's the egomaniac. He's the one that wants to still worship from God. But he flips the script and he causes people to believe that the yeah. God we serve is the egomaniac. And in reality, the God that we serve is a good God. Amen. That, and you know how you know that? Because he gave of himself to give life to you and me. Yeah. He, he bankrupted heaven of its most prized possession. Jesus. The word that spoke the world into existence. He gave us Jesus, the sinless one, to die for us. He gave of himself. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus loved us so much that he gave us his gift of righteousness. How did he get that to you? He had to die on a cross. He took your shame and your guilt. That's what it says in Romans chapter 5, verse 17, that the gift that was given was the gift of righteousness. And the only way that that can happen is that he took our shame and he gave us his righteousness when he died for us on the cross. Singers and musicians, y'all can come back up. We're going <laughs> to leave the house of the Lord this morning with a worship song in our heart. God will make sure that he gets the glory. I said it once, but let's say it again. Satan will try to paralyze us with a spirit of fear. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. God wants to give glory to his name so you can expect a victory in your life if you're willing to trust him and let him use you. It looked like the odds were against them. And in the natural, it must have seemed like it was getting worse. Lord, what are you doing? We start off with 20, 32,000. Then you whittle it down to 10,000. Then you whittle it all the way down to 300. This is crazy. We can never win now. Have you ever felt that way? It just keeps getting worse. Sometimes I've been, listen, I've been in so much debt in my life because I didn't spend my money properly. Can I just be real with you? I've learned through the process of time, I don't care how much money you make, you can overspend. Yeah. Sure. And I have been sometimes in so much debt that I felt like I was in a pit and they were throwing dirt on me. God knows how to pull us out of the pit. Yeah. That's just one little illustration, one little example. God knows how to, how to, how to pull us out of there. And sometimes things seem overwhelming, but I'm here to tell you, I got good news. We serve a supernatural God that can do supernatural things. Hallelujah. It looks like the odds were against them. We'll never win now. No, no, no. You will never win as long as you are trying to win in your own strength. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. Amen. Now let's cry out to God in the midst of our pain. And watch him move in our life. Amen. The altar calls this morning. If you want to come to the altar for prayer, just seek the face of the Lord. We just need to worship God this morning. Maybe there's been things in your life and you haven't been able to trust God. You feel overwhelmed. You feel like you don't know how you're going to get out. I'm here to tell you this morning that God's looking for some Gideons that will believe him. That will get up out the wine press. And will go back to Jehovah Shalom. Amen. And trust the Lord in the battle. Amen. Thank you, Lord.